Do you ever hear strange noises in the night? Have you ever seen something move in a mass of trees out of the corner of your eye? Or have you ever seen lights in the sky that you can't explain? Have you ever thought it was a ghost, or a cryptid, or something otherworldly? Sure, there may be logical explanations, but sometimes things happen that we simply can't explain. We'll examine these stories on our brand new channel, Paranormally Listed. If you love stories about hauntings, mysterious creatures, UFOs, and other unexplained phenomenon, we'd love it if you subscribed. Paranormally Listed goes live on Halloween night at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. You can find a link to the new channel in the description box below. Before we get into today's video, I just want to take a few moments to talk about our wonderful sponsor, Magellan TV. I love finding great new documentaries or documentary series, so that's why I love Magellan TV. In their new releases section, I found this amazing series called Lady Killers with Martina Cole. Martina Cole is a British crime writer, and in the series, she talks about some of the scariest and most disturbing cases of female serial killers. There are six episodes, and each one of them are fascinating. But I like the episodes about Rosemary West and Myra Hindley the best. Their stories are just so disturbing. Lady Killers is just one of 3,000 documentaries in the Magellan TV library. 15 to 20 hours of new material is being added every week, so there's always something new to watch. You have to check out their true crime section. They have some great selections. Magellan TV has an amazing offer for criminally listed viewers. Sign up right now and you'll get a month for free. Just go to try.magellantv.com to get the month for free. So please check out Magellan TV today because you'll find something great to watch and you'll be supporting criminally listed. Number 3. Pierre Merson In the fall of 1996, Pierre Merson was 21 years old and he lived in Thornhill, which is a city in the greater Toronto area. On Halloween night, Pierre was going out not just to enjoy the festivities, but he was also going out to celebrate recently graduating from a government course. That night, Pierre was dressed in green army fatigues, a green wool hat, an army poncho, and a long black wig. His mother, Norma, dropped him off at the Six Sports Bar in the neighboring city of Richmond Hill. Around 2 a.m., Pierre called his mother, Norma, and asked her to pick him up. She told him she would get him at an intersection near the bar. About 15 minutes after the call, Norma arrived at the intersection, but her son was nowhere to be found. There were other people outside the bar, and the band was loading their equipment onto a truck. Norma asked some of the patrons if they had seen her son. A few people said that they saw him leave a little while ago. Other people thought he had gotten into a taxi. Some other people thought he went to a nearby cafe. Norma went into the bar and looked around. Under a table, she found her son's poncho. But no other trace of Pierre was found in the bar. Norma never saw her son again. She reported him missing that night. In 1997, the police said they had a suspect and they arrested him. However, he was released the same day due to lack of evidence. Pierre's family was devastated by his disappearance. Norma spent countless hours posting missing persons posters. Pierre's brother, Alexander, went door to door asking if anyone had any information about his brother's disappearance. Alexander eventually moved to Florida. Up until the bar permanently closed, the family held annual vigils. Pierre went missing in York Region and the York Region Police Department only has one cold case investigator. He said that Pierre didn't have any reason to disappear and his bank account has not been touched since that night. So he doesn't think he chose to disappear on his own accord. Pierre also didn't have any enemies. The investigator thinks that Pierre happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. This makes his case even more difficult because the person responsible for his disappearance probably had no connection to him. 
they were probably strangers to each other. Investigators believe that Pierre Masson is dead. If he isn't, at the time of this recording, he would be 46 years old. Pierre Marsan is described as 5'11", Caucasian male with brown hair and hazel eyes. Number 2. Patricia Spencer and Pamela Hobley Escoda is an unincorporated area in Michigan. It's situated at the mouth of the Osabo River and it's a popular spot for trout fishing. On Halloween Day 1969, Escoda High School received a bomb threat so the students were sent outside while the school was searched. Two students, 16-year-old Pamela Hobley and 15-year-old Patricia Spencer, decided to use the opportunity to leave school and skip their afternoon classes. The girls were considered acquaintances, but they weren't close friends. That evening, the high school was holding their homecoming football game and there was going to be a Halloween party afterward. Both Pamela and Patricia planned on attending the game and the party, but neither of them did and they did not return home that night. Their families reported them missing. Initially, the police thought that the girls might be runaways, but neither girl brought their purse, identification, or things like extra clothes with them. Also, both girls were close to their families and they had no reason to run away. When the young women didn't contact their families within days or weeks of their disappearance, the police realized that they may have met with foul play. The investigators tried their best to trace their last steps. A person came forward and he said he gave them a ride to a gas station that was a short distance from the school. The young women were last seen walking on a road not far from the gas station. No one has any idea where they were going. Sadly, the police had very few leads and it wasn't long before the case went cold. In 1985, 16 years after the girls disappeared, the police received a tip. They said that two local men murdered the girls. Then their bodies were buried near a bar that was a popular place for teenagers to have parties. The area was searched with cadaver dogs, but nothing of interest was found. A new investigator took over the case in 2010, 41 years after the young women went missing, but he didn't make much progress. There are simply not enough clues to go on. He said that there is a person of interest, but he did not reveal his identity or why he is considered a person of interest. Most people believe that the wrong person or persons picked the girls up. They were murdered and then their bodies were disposed of. The families of the two young women have accepted that they are probably dead. They are still hoping to get closure by finding out who killed them and what he, she, or they did to their bodies. It's been 52 years since Patricia Spencer and Pamela Hobley disappeared. If they are alive today, Patricia would be 67 and Pamela would be 68. Number 1. Hyun Jung Song Hyun Jung Song was born on February 25, 1980 in South Korea. In 1995, she moved to Springfield, Virginia to live with relatives. In the United States, she adopted the name Cindy. She graduated from high school and then enrolled at the Pennsylvania State University. She was majoring in integrative arts. On Halloween night 2001, Song, who was 21, went to a bar called Players Nightclub. She was wearing bunny ears, a pink sleeveless shirt with a picture of a rabbit on it, and a white tennis skirt with a cotton button tail on the back of it. Song left the bar at about 2 a.m and then she went to a friend's home. She stayed there for at least 90 minutes. Then sometime between 3.30 and 4 a.m., one of Song's friends dropped her off at her residence on campus. Then 21-year-old Han Jung Song vanished into thin air. 
Three days after she was last seen, Song's friends reported her missing. The police searched her room. They did not find any signs of forced entry or a struggle. They found Song's cell phone and it had been turned off. There were no incoming or echoing calls around the time she disappeared. Her purse with her credit cards, driver's license, and keys were missing. None of her friends had any idea who would want to hurt her. She didn't have any enemies or personal problems. Her friends said that she wasn't depressed, so they doubted that she would have taken her own life. There are several theories regarding what happened to Song. One is that she was kidnapped from her residence. Another theory is that she walked to a nearby store and she was kidnapped along the way. Months after Song disappeared, at the end of January 2002, the police announced that the case was inactive because there was no new leads to pursue. Two years later, the police got a promising lead. The police in Monroe County, Pennsylvania were investigating a home invasion. They narrowed in on a suspect, Paul Weekly. Weekly admitted that he and his partner, 30-year-old Hugo Slinsky, a convicted bank robber, committed the home invasion. Weekly told the police that Slinsky had a property in Kingston Township, Pennsylvania. He said that five bodies were buried on the property. The police went to the property and they found the remains of five people. Weekly told the police that Slinsky used to be involved in criminal activity with another man named Michael Kurkowski. Kurkowski had been a pharmacist, but he had been arrested and convicted of selling painkillers without a prescription. Weekly said that early on November 1, 2001, Slinsky and Kurkowski were cruising around the campus where Song lived. Slinsky saw Song walking and thought that she was a prostitute, so they grabbed her. They ended up locking her in a walk-in safe and she died a few days later. DNA testing was done on the bodies found buried on Slinsky's property. Another remains were Hung Young Song. The police were not able to ask Michael Gorkowski if the accusations were true. One of the five bodies that they recovered was his body. On May 3rd, 2002, Slinsky and Weekly went to Gorkowski's home. Krakowski's girlfriend, 36-year-old Tammy Lynn Fassett, was there. They got Krakowski and Fassett inside and they bound them. They beat and tortured Krakowski until he revealed the location of the money from the sales of the painkillers. Then they used plastic ties to strangle 37-year-old Michael Krakowski and 36-year-old Tammy Lynn Fassett. Then they were buried on Slinsky's property. Two other bodies that were buried on the property were 29-year-old Frank James and 22-year-old Adai Keeler. Weekly said that on May 14, 2003, Slinsky and another man, 33-year-old Pat Russin, robbed them and then shot them to death with shotguns. Then their bodies were burned in a pit and then the remains were buried on the property. The police have never publicly identified the fifth body that was buried on the property. Hugo Slinsky was charged with four counts of murder in addition to the charges stemming from the January 2003 home invasion. On October 10, 2003, Slinsky and another inmate managed to escape from jail by climbing down a rope made from bedsheets. Slinsky turned himself in three days later. A month later, Pat Russin pleaded guilty to two counts of third-degree homicide. He was sentenced to 10 to 20 years of prison. In February 2006, Hugo Slinsky went to trial for the murders of the two drug dealers, Frank James and Adai Keeler. The trial lasted two weeks. Slinsky was acquitted in the murder of James, and the jury was deadlocked when it came to the murder of Keeler. He was convicted of abusing their corpses. 
In June 2008, Paul Weekly was sentenced to life in prison for his role in the murder of Michael Krakowski and Tammy Lynn Fassett. In July 2009, Slinsky was found guilty regarding all the charges from the January 2003 home invasion. In September 2009, he was sentenced to 32 and a half years to 65 years of prison. Finally, in January 2015, Slinsky went to trial for the murders of Michael Krakowski and Tammy Lynn Fassett. He was ultimately found guilty of both murders. He was sentenced to life in prison. Hugo Slinsky has never said if he was involved in the disappearance of Hung Young Song. Paul Weekly said that Slinsky told him that he buried her body in Luzerne County, Pennsylvania. The police said they have not confirmed what Weekly told them about Song's disappearance. They did say that he was truthful and accurate in everything else that he told them, so they have no reason to doubt him. As a result, the police think that Hugo Slinsky is a viable suspect in Song's disappearance. 48-year-old Hugo Slinsky is currently serving a sentence at the State Correctional Institution at Fayette in LaBelle, Pennsylvania. If Hong Young, Cindy Song, is still alive at the time of this video, she will be 41 years old. Thank you so much for watching today's video. But don't forget to check out our podcast, Into the Killing. In our latest episode, we talk about brutal serial killer you may have never heard of, Edward Surratt. He killed over a dozen people in less than a year. You can find Into the Killing on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, and anywhere you find great podcasts. But that's all for today. Thanks again for watching.